There exists within our world a myriad of mysteries, often too complex to fathom. Such is the case of the Egyptian pyramids. Within the pyramids and scattered around the region, there are whispers of technology that beckon understanding. Technology that could not have been produced when we're told the pyramids were constructed. Tools used for common sculpture could not have produced these advanced technical artifacts, yet they exist and cannot be quantified. If we are to believe modern Egyptologists, the pyramids were built to be elaborate tombs for pharaohs and kings, a statement that is laughable in the face of its own construction and enormity. Though it is claimed that Egyptians built the pyramids in Cairo, we have little knowledge that this historical suggestion is indeed fact. The truth is, we have no idea who built the pyramids, nor what their purpose was. Of the three main pyramids in Egypt, whose construction is beyond even what we could create today, there are a multitude of unanswered questions about them and their purpose. The two questions that elude us is how and why. If we can find the answer to these two simple questions, then the mysteries of the pyramids fall away and a new understanding of them and ourselves will replace the ignorance we live with today. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus once described the pyramid builders as slaves, creating what Egyptologists say is a myth later propagated by Hollywood films. Dieter Wildung, a former director of Berlin's Egyptian Museum said it's common knowledge in serious Egyptology that the pyramid builders were not slaves and that the construction of the pyramids and the story of the Israelites in Egypt were separated by hundreds of years. Herein lies the mythology of the construction of the pyramids. Through media, we're told by slaves. Yet scientists believe they were devoted worshippers of the pharaohs. Even the common accepted belief of the pyramid builders are in conflict. If the pyramids were constructed by slaves or the devout, it only covers the labor force needed to build them. How they were created with such precise technological achievement remains a mystery. The Great Pyramid is constructed of 2,500,000 solid blocks, perfectly aligned. The blocks weigh between 2.5 to 10 tons each each stone for the construction of 25 Empire State Buildings. Initially, the Great Pyramid was covered in limestone and was visible from 160 kilometers away and was shining like a precious jewel. We are taught that the Great Pyramid was built as a tomb for the Pharaoh Khufu, but modern discoveries show otherwise. Khufu's name was discovered in the so-called mortuary chamber inside the pyramid, but nobody spoke of it until 1837. Egyptologist Zachrin Sitchin discovered that the writing is a fraud and was painted in May of 1837. After examining the writing, Sitchin discovered that it is indeed a fraud, especially because the counterfeiters misspelled the pharaoh's name Instead of Khufu, they wrote Rufu. Khufu's alleged sarcophagus is almost half his size and carved directly into stone. Not only that the pharaoh would not fit in it, but it was also not suited for royalty. The so-called Queen's Mortuary Chamber is sealed by a huge stone block and doesn't even contain a sarcophagus. In fact, 
no one knows what the word pyramid really means, and no roots for this word were ever found anywhere on earth. None of the historians' statements regarding the pyramids has been proven. They say that the pyramids were built as tombs for the mummified pharaohs, but not a single mummy has ever been found inside the Great Pyramids. The Egyptians had no knowledge of modern geology, and without this knowledge, it is impossible for such a construction not to crumble or sink. The Great Pyramid, weighing 14 billion pounds, has sunk only 1.5 centimeters. In modern constructions, it's an extraordinary achievement to keep each side of the building at a deviation of 6 inches, but the Great Pyramid has a deviation of only 0.25 inches. This is impossible to replicate today with our modern technology. The stone blocks are placed with a tolerance of 1,000 to 2 thousandths of an inch so precisely that a razor blade doesn't fit between them. Mathematicians say during the construction of the pyramids, the Egyptians should have used several very advanced concepts and formulas which have allegedly been discovered only thousands of years later. The geographical orientation of the Great Pyramid is probably the most amazing characteristic. Its sides are almost perfectly placed from north to south and east to west, being almost perfectly oriented on Earth's true north. How was a civilization from the quasi-Stone Age capable of determining true north? The true north is calculated on a map by using the longitudinal lines and it's different than the magnetic north indicated by compass. The true north is located in the Arctic regions of Canada and continuously changes its location depending on Earth's magnetic field. The construction of the Great Pyramid shows extraordinary astronomy knowledge. The constructors would measure the day, the year, and could precisely determine the equinox. They knew the Earth is a sphere and knew how to accurately calculate its longitude and latitude. Studies also show that the Egyptian Sphinx is at least 5,000 years older than history says, which means that it is at least 10,000 years old, while others say it could be as old as 15,000 years. In 1813, the astronomer Richard Proctor discovered from ancient archives that the Great Pyramids were indeed aligned to the stars. It has been also discovered that the pyramids are highly receptive of radio energetic waves or even cosmic microwaves. Above the so-called mortuary chamber inside the Great Pyramid, there are five huge granite tiles placed in layers with spaces between them. The layers end with some kind of V-shaped roof pointing up. No one knows why. According to the official version of history, the construction of the Great Pyramid alone lasted for 20 years. Slaves or worshippers worked in groups of 100,000 and were replaced every three months. For the Great Pyramid to be constructed in 20 years, one stone block weighing 2.5 to 10 tons each should have been placed every three and a half minutes working non-stop 24-7. It's an absurd statement because we don't have this kind of technology even today. According to Egyptologists, the pyramids were constructed in the fourth Egyptian dynasty using ramps. The historians want us to believe that the slaves lifted the huge stone blocks on ramps constructed around the pyramids and these ramps were demolished afterwards. Actually, the effort to build gigantic ramps would have been greater than the construction of the pyramids themselves. The debris from the Great Pyramid alone would have been nearly 3 million tons. But where's the debris? This enormous quantity can't be hidden in the desert. 
These historians also want us to believe that the massive stone blocks were carried to the construction site on rolling logs. The only available trees in ancient Egypt were the date palms, but these were the primary food source. It's very improbable that the Egyptians would have cut their main food source for this purpose. At least 25 million logs would have been needed, which is way above the entire Egyptian import industry of any kind in their entire history. But even if the Egyptians would have tried this, the massive stone blocks would have crushed the logs. The enigma of the pyramids doesn't stop at their sheer size and weight. Within the region of the pyramids have been found many artifacts that preclude the possibility the Egyptians, or whoever built the pyramids, had only rudimentary technology. The schist disk was discovered at Saqqara. Its purpose can only be guessed at. It is approximately 30 centimeters in diameter and only one centimeter thick. It's currently on display in the Cairo Museum and is labeled as an incense container, although there is no evidence to support this. What is certain is that at this early time, the early dynasty period, stone carvings are already a sophisticated skill. This object is 5,000 years old. Egyptians would not discover the wheel until 1640. It was manufactured by unknown means from schist, a very fragile and delicate material requiring very tedious carving, the production of which would confound many craftsmen even today. It resembles an impeller for pumping water. If it were mounted on an axle and spun at a certain speed constantly, not too fast, it would create a resonating hypnotic resonance. Egyptologist Cyril Aldred reached the conclusion that independently of what the object was used for or what it represented, its design was without a doubt a copy of a previous, much older metallic object. Why did the ancient Egyptians bother to design an object with such a complex structure more than 5,000 years ago? Interesting that this disc was discovered in the same location as the Saqqara bird, an object that appears to be an airplane rather than a bird. Its wings are on top of the bird and it has a raised tail like the rudder of a plane. How could a culture who typically used chisels to shape rock have mastered a technique to work such a delicate material to this extraordinary level? Why would ancient Egyptians invest the time and skills needed to create this object unless it served a very important specific purpose? Obviously, the Shisk disk is an object that played an important role 5,000 years ago. Egyptologists offer a number of theories trying to explain what the disk was used for, but for the moment, no one has been able to explain the object's complex structure. The Schist disk futuristic design continues to baffle all who have seen it. There is no doubt this particular object continues to constitute one of the most perplexing Egyptian and ancient mysteries, and we're left with several unanswered questions. There is good evidence of machined artifacts at Giza. The few tools from the period were insufficient to explain Egyptian artifacts. It's almost undeniable that some kind of machine power was used by the pyramid builders. Egyptologists maintain that the work, including granite, 
was completed with copper and stone tools, although this has been contested on the basis that the spiral tool marks in certain core samples indicate that a metal or precious stone stronger than copper would have been required. There is plenty of evidence that core drills were used at Giza. The classic example being the tool marks found inside the sarcophagus of the Great Pyramid. As the stone that was being cut is granite, the surface of the drill tip would have had to have included a material of equal or greater hardness in order to cut through the stone. In itself, this is an amazing achievement. But when we look closer at the drill marks, it's evident that a great amount of downward pressure was applied to the drills as well, more than can be explained by conventional theory. The distance between the grooves created by core drilling can be used as a measure of how much force was applied as drilling was in process. The feed rate of modern drills is easily measured per revolution. A study of the feed rate of Egyptian drill marks indicate that the Egyptians drilled into granite with a feed rate that was 500 times greater or deeper per revolution than our modern drills. It's often forgotten that before the Great Pyramid was built, that the limestone plateau beneath was first leveled and over it was placed a platform of carefully cut stones, which can still be seen to protrude from under the pyramid base. This platform is about 0.5 millimeters thick, and despite the passing of time and several earthquakes, remains level to within 0.8 of an inch over the entire Giza Plateau. The whole of the Great Pyramid was originally covered with a coat of polished limestone blocks, which would have originally given the aspect of Giza a smooth and perfect finish all over. The faces of these blocks have bunting surfaces which was cut to within one one hundredth of an inch of mathematical precision. The basalt pavement stones are irregular in thickness and sometimes rounded on the bottom side. They were placed on top of blocks of Tura limestone, which had previously been fitted to the underlying bedrock. These basalt blocks were cut to level in situ after they had been put in place on the ground. The crisp and parallel edges demonstrate the high quality of this work and indicates that the blade was held completely steady. It appears that cutting basalt was not so slow and arduous that extra cuts like these would have been avoided as being an unnecessary waste of time. In other words, they had something that could cut quickly and if they made a mistake, they could simply readjust the blade and cut again. If they were cutting by hand, they would not need to make any adjustments because the first cut would be sufficient and could be adjusted as they cut. The King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid is covered over with several granite stones estimated at 50 to 70 tons each. The gable stones over the entrance and several of the stones covering the descending passage are also several cubic meters in size. A modern crane cannot set these stones in place so perfectly. It is unclear whether they had much clearance to install these vaults or how they lowered them. Several 5th and 6th dynasty pyramids included gable roofs with blocks weighing up to 90 tons, but the subject is almost ignored so it's hard to check facts. Some of them are known to have a clearance of less than an inch. This may have involved sliding it straight in order to get it in place, which would be extremely difficult with a vault that may have weighed over 100 tons. The quartzite sarcophagus of Amenhet III, weighing 110 metric tons, was placed in a chamber with an interior length of 7 meters and walls of 1 meter thick. 
The monolithic lid was lowered onto the sarcophagus by means of sand flow, and the chamber was later covered with another two huge 50-ton limestone vaulting stones. Above the burial chamber were two relieving chambers. This was topped with 50-ton limestone slabs forming a pointed roof. Then an enormous arc of brick three feet thick was built over the pointed roof to support the core of the pyramid. This is enormously precise for a sarcophagus, and yet the sarcophagus was found to be empty when opened. No body was placed inside, and no one could have opened this vault. Assuming that the Great Pyramid was actually built in the dynastic period and isn't much older, it is not surprising that the occasional eyebrow was raised in the past concerning the extent of the Egyptian masonry skills during this period. Not only were the structures superior in a visionary capacity, but also in precision, design, and execution. The dynastic period of Egypt heralded a time of extraordinary achievement. It was the age of the pyramid builders when some of the largest and most sophisticated structures of all time were built, including the last remaining seven wonders of the ancient world, all built in the Neolithic period, or so we are told. Is it possible that the people of this era could have fashioned such wonders with only rudimentary tools? Or could the pyramids and all the artifacts in the area actually point to a much more advanced society? Unusual artifacts have been found in the area of the Great Pyramid. As mentioned before in 1898, a curious winged object was discovered in the tomb of Padalim in North Saqqara, Egypt, dating to about 200 BC. Because the birth of modern aviation was still several years away, when the strange artifact was sent to the Cairo Museum, it was catalogued and then shelved among other miscellaneous items to gather dust. Twenty years later, Dr. Kali Messiah, an Egyptologist and archaeologist, was examining a museum display labeled bird figurines. While most of the display was indeed bird sculptures, the Saqqara artifact was certainly not. It possessed characteristics never found on birds, yet which were part of modern aircraft design. Dr. Messiah, a former model plane enthusiast, immediately recognized the aircraft features and persuaded the Egyptian Ministry of Culture to investigate. Made of light sycamore, the craft has straight and aerodynamically shaped wings spanning about seven inches. A separate slotted piece fits into the tail precisely like the back wing on a modern airplane. A full-scale version could have flown carrying heavy loads, but at low speeds between 45 and 65 miles per hour. What is not known, however, is what the power source was. The model makes a perfect glider as it is. Even though it's over 2,000 years old, it will soar a considerable distance with only a slight jerk of the hand. Fully restored balsa replicas travel even further. The ancient Egyptians often built scale models of everything familiar in their daily lives and placed them in their tombs, temples, ships, chariots, and so forth. Now that we have found a model plane, we must wonder if perhaps somewhere under the desert sands there may yet be unearthed the remains of life-size gliders. The Baghdad battery is often mentioned as a technology from the Middle East that should not exist. 
It was unearthed in the ruins of a Parthian village outside Baghdad in 1938 by a German archaeologist. It is a 5 inch long clay jar containing a copper cylinder that its edge was soldered with a 6040 lead tin alloy and its bottom was capped with a crimped in copper disc and held in place with asphalt or butamen. Another insulating layer of asphalt sealed the top and also protected an iron bar suspended into the center of the cylinder. It was about 2,000 years old. The Parthians were skilled warriors and their scientific achievements were not known. It would appear then that they inherited these batteries from some of the earliest known civilizations. According to the experts, the device, after being filled with an acid or alkaline liquid, could create an electric charge. It's believed that this old battery might have been used to electroplate silver, but it's only one of the theories. It's important to emphasize that electric batteries were not invented until 1799. An amazing parallel to the Egyptian airplane is that something similar has also been found in Latin America. Incas and other pre-Columbian people left behind some extremely puzzling trinkets. Some of the strangest are probably the so-called ancient aeroplanes, which are small golden figurines that closely resemble modern jet planes. Originally thought to be zoomorphic, the statues were soon found to have features that look very much like fighter plane wings, stabilizing tails, and even landing gear. They were aerodynamic enough that when ancient astronaut believers made model planes with their proportions and fitted them with propellers and jet engines, they flew perfectly. All of this has led to speculation that the Incas may have been in contact with extraterrestrial people who were able to build advanced jet planes and who perhaps even possessed the technology themselves. The word paper comes from the Greek term for the ancient Egyptian writing material called papyrus, which was formed from beaten strips of papyrus plants. Early Egyptian technology and methods may have been written down, but none of it has survived to this day because papyrus was so fragile. Because of this, we may never know exactly how monuments and obelisks were lifted into place, or even if they were made by or simply discovered by the Egyptians. The unfinished obelisk is the largest known ancient obelisk and is located in the northern region of the stone quarries of ancient Egypt in Aswan, Egypt. It is nearly one-third larger than any ancient Egyptian obelisk ever erected. If finished, it would have measured around 137 feet and would have weighed nearly 1,200 tons. No one knows how the Egyptians would have erected the object, nor how they planned to move it into place 364 miles away. Even today, this would have been a monumental task, perhaps even impossible. The obelisk creators began to carve it directly out of bedrock, but cracks appeared in the granite and the project was abandoned. The bottom side of the obelisk is still attached to the bedrock. The unfinished obelisk offers unusual insights into ancient Egyptian stoneworking techniques with marks from workers' tools still clearly visible as well as ochre-colored lines marking where they were working. Many of these marks appear to have been scooped out of the rock as if the rock was soft like butter or ice cream. The ancient Egyptians had no such tools to do this. Besides the unfinished obelisk, an unfinished partly worked obelisk base was discovered in 2005 at the quarries of Aswan. Also discovered were some rock carvings and remains that may correspond to the site where most of the famous obelisks were worked. Many of the huge stones in pyramids came from this same quarry and displays such precise technology 
as to have had to have been machined. It will probably surprise many people to know that evidence proving that the ancient Egyptians used tools such as straight saws, circular saws, and even lathes has been recognized for over a century. The lathe is the father of all machine tools in existence and evidence showing that not only were lathes used by the ancient Egyptians, but they performed tasks which would, by today's standards, be considered impossible without highly developed specialized techniques, such as cutting concave and convex spherical radii without splintering the material. Today's granite cutting methods includes the use of wire saws and an abrasive, usually silicon carbide, which slices through granite with ease. By looking at shapes of the cuts that were made in the basalt items, one could certainly speculate that a wire saw had been used and left its imprint on the rock. The full radius at the bottom of the cut is exactly the shape that would be left by such a saw. How could ancient Egyptians have carved and moved such huge stones miles away from their destination without modern machinery? Did they invent and use advanced technology, then discard it? Or could advanced technology and methods been provided to them? Tool marks and boreholes made with copper tools softer than the material being shaped? How is this possible? Methods such as this are not only found in Egypt, but the same use of advanced tools can be found around the world. In Peru and Bolivia, there are many examples of advanced technology use, specifically in Pumapunca. At its peak, Pumapunca is thought to have been unimaginably wondrous, adorned with polished metal plaques, brightly colored ceramic and fabric ornamentation, trafficked by costumed citizens, elaborately dressed priests, and elites decked in exotic jewelry. Current understanding of this complex is limited due to its age, the lack of a written record, the current deteriorating state of the structures due to treasure hunting, looting, stone mining for building stone and railroad ballasts, and natural weathering. Geophysical data collected from surveys and excavations have revealed in the area of Pumapunka are complexes and numerous man-made structures. These structures include the wall foundations of buildings and compounds, water conduits, pool-like features, terraces, residential compounds, and widespread gravel pavements, all of which now lie buried and hidden beneath the modern ground surface. In assembling the walls of Pumapunka, each stone was finely cut to interlock with the surrounding stones, and the blocks fit together like a puzzle, forming load-bearing joints without the use of mortar. One common engineering technique involves cutting the top of the lower stone at a certain angle and placing another stone on top of it, which was cut at the same angle. The precision with which these angles have been utilized to create flush joints is indicative of a highly sophisticated knowledge of stone cutting and a thorough understanding of descriptive geometry. Notable features at Puma Punka are I-shaped architectural cramps, which are composed of a unique copper arsenic nickel bronze alloy. These cramps were used to hold the blocks comprising the walls and bottom of stone lined canals that drain sunken courts. Eye cramps of unknown composition were used to hold together the massive slabs that formed Pumapunka's four large platforms. In sharp contrast, 
The cramps used at another canal were fashioned by cold hammering of copper, arsenic, nickel, bronze ingots. Machu Picchu is another location that has observable advanced technology. Rocks lining the Incan Palace appear to have been molded or melted to fit perfectly together. A rock believed to be a solar clock has right angle cuts that appear machined. The Incans never used the wheel, yet stones were quarried from an adjacent mountain and moved up the mountain ridge above the sacred valley by methods no one is sure of today. A few stones have knobs that could have been used to lever them into position. It's believed that after placing the stones, the builders would have sanded the knobs away, but a few were overlooked. The technology is similar in many ways to the methods visible in the Egyptian pyramids. Egyptians were not the only people to build pyramids. Ziggurats were built by the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Elamites, Akkadians, and Assyrians for local religions. Each ziggurat was part of a temple complex which included other buildings. At Menaki, the name for a Sumerian structure means Temple of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth. The date of its original construction is unknown with suggested dates ranging from the 14th to the 9th century BC, with textual evidence suggesting it existed in the second millennium. It is considered the possible inspiration to the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. It's also possible that this ziggurat predates even the Egyptian pyramids. It is not known how many pyramids exist or have existed throughout antiquity. Suffice it to say, the number is well into the triple digits, perhaps even thousands. Pyramids have been built by civilizations in many parts of the world. For thousands of years, the largest structures on Earth were pyramids, first the Red Pyramid in the Dishar Necropolis, and then the Great Pyramid of Khufu, both of Egypt. The latter is the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world still remaining. Signs of advanced technology have been found in and around pyramids worldwide. Technology that many say could not have been the invention of early man who had barely made it out of caves or roamed the savannas and plains of earth. If humans didn't have this knowledge, where did it come from? Where did early man get the inspiration to build such monumental structures and the technology to construct them? Where did the inspiration for, or the actual design of the pyramids, come from? Proponents of the ancient astronaut hypothesis often maintain that humans are either descendants or creations of extraterrestrial beings who landed on Earth thousands of years ago. An associated idea is that humans evolved independently but that much of human knowledge, religion, and culture came from extraterrestrial visitors in ancient times, in that ancient astronauts acted as a mother culture. Some ancient astronaut proponents also believe that travelers from outer space, referred to as astronauts or spacemen, built many of the structures on Earth, such as the Egyptian pyramids and the Moai stone heads of Easter Island, or aided humans in building them. Proponents argue that the evidence for ancient astronauts comes from documentary gaps in historical and archaeological records, and they also maintain that absent or incomplete explanations of historical or archaeological data point to the existence of ancient astronauts. 
The evidence is argued to include archaeological artifacts that they deem beyond the accepted technical capabilities of the historical cultures with which they are associated. These are sometimes referred to as out-of-place artifacts and include artwork and legends which are interpreted in a modern sense as depicting extraterrestrial contact or technologies. Eric von Donneken was a leading proponent of this hypothesis in the late 1960s and early 1970s. He gained a large audience through the 1968 publication of his best-selling book, Chariots of the Gods and its sequels. Certain artifacts and monumental constructions are claimed by von Donneken to have required a more sophisticated technological ability in their construction than that which was available to the ancient cultures who constructed them. Von Donneken maintains that these artifacts were constructed either directly by extraterrestrial visitors or by humans who learn the necessary knowledge from the visitors. These include Stonehenge, Pumapunka, the Moai of Easter Island, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and the ancient Baghdad electric batteries. Von Donneken claims that ancient art and iconography throughout the world illustrates air and space vehicles, non-human but intelligent creatures, ancient astronauts, and artifacts of an advanced technology. Von Donneken also claims that geographically separated historical cultures share artistic themes which he argues imply a common origin. One such example is von Donneken's interpretation of the sarcophagus lid recovered from the tomb of the classic era Maya ruler of Palenque. Von Donneken claimed the design represented a seated astronaut, whereas the iconography and accompanying Maya text identifies it as a portrait of the ruler himself with the world tree of Maya mythology. An ancient Sumerian myth inscribed on cuneiform tablets says humankind was created to serve gods called the Anunnaki. Hypothesis proponents believe the Anunnaki were aliens who came to Earth to mine gold for their home planet. According to the story, the Anunnaki realized mining gold was taking a toll on their race and then created the human race as slaves. In Hindu mythology, the gods and their avatars travel from place to place in flying vehicles called Vamana. There are many mentions of these flying machines in the Ramayana, which dates to the 5th or 4th century BC. In the Old Testament chapter 1 of the book of Ezekiel, it recounts a vision in which Ezekiel sees an immense cloud that contains fire and emits lightning and brilliant light. It continues, the center of the fire looked like glowing metal and in it the fire was what looked like four living creatures. These creatures are described as winged and humanoid. They sped back and forth like flashes of lightning and fire moved back and forth among the creatures. The passage goes on to describe four shiny objects, each appearing like a wheel intersecting a wheel. These objects could fly, and they moved with the creatures. Proponents of the ancient astronaut theory say this is a clear description of a flying saucer-type craft or spaceship. Ancient astronaut theorists believe Hopi cave drawings found in the southwestern United States desert link the origins of Hopi and Zuni tribes with star people or Kachinas. They point to similar etchings elsewhere as evidence that extraterrestrials visited many different ancient civilizations. They state that the Hopi and Zuni drawings depict contact with beings from space who are not gods but have brought knowledge from another planet. 
More support of this hypothesis draws upon what are claimed to be representations of flying saucers in medieval and Renaissance art. This is used to support the ancient astronaut hypothesis by attempting to show that the creators of humanity return to Earth periodically. Evidence for ancient astronauts is claimed to include the existence of ancient monuments and megalithic ruins such as the Giza pyramids of Egypt or Baalbek in Lebanon. Supporters contend these stone structures could not have been built with the technical abilities and tools of the people of the time and further argue that many could not be duplicated even today. They suggest that the large size of the building stones, the precision with which they were laid, and the distances many were transported leaves the question open as to who constructed these sites. A number of ancient cultures, such as the ancient Egyptians and some Native Americans, artificially lengthened the skulls of their children. Some ancient astronaut proponents proposed that this was done to emulate extraterrestrial visitors whom they saw as gods. It is possible that some of the skulls known today could be from aliens themselves. Among the ancient rulers depicted with elongated skulls are Pharaoh Akhenaten and Nefertiti. It has been pointed out that the gray aliens described by many alien abductees have similarly shaped heads. In the program Ancient Aliens, it was suggested that the owners of the biggest of the lengthened skulls may be human extraterrestrial hybrids. The ancient Nazca Lines are hundreds of huge ground drawings etched into the high desert of southern Peru. Some are stylized animals and humanoid figures, while others are merely straight lines hundreds of meters long. As the features were made to be seen from a great height, they have been linked with the ancient astronaut hypothesis. A cargo cult is a modern term used to describe the actions of a less advanced civilization when it comes in contact with a modern or technically advanced civilization. The most widely known period of cargo cult activity occurred among islanders in the years during and after World War II. A small population of indigenous people observed often right in front of their dwellings the largest war ever fought by technologically advanced nations. This caused them to build effigies of airplanes and other things they had seen. Some went on to worship the foreigners and tried rituals to lure the advanced people back. Many ancient astronaut theorists believe the Nazca lines and other structures or artifacts found around the world were the result of ancient people being witness to advanced technology and their attempt to communicate with the extraterrestrials. Did ancient man have contact with aliens with advanced technology? Could they have learned from these aliens or been instructed how to build their structures and monuments? Could they have had direct help to build ancient mathematically precise artifacts? Or could early man have had some spiritual epiphany that resulted in his advanced knowledge in ancient times? The Orion Correlation Theory is a hypothesis in alternative Egyptology. Its central claim is that there is a correlation between the location of the three largest pyramids of the Giza Pyramid Complex and Orion's belt of the constellation Orion, and that this correlation was intended as such by the builders of the pyramids. The stars of Orion were associated with Osiris the god of rebirth and afterlife by the ancient Egyptians. 
Depending on the version of the theory, additional pyramids can be included to complete the picture of the Orion constellation, and the Nile River can be included to match with the Milky Way galaxy. 12,500 years ago, the constellation of Leo rose directly east of the Sphinx, and Orion would align with the pyramids. Many use this date to explain the actual age of the pyramid complex at Giza. By using this date and aligning the stars with the pyramids, one can clearly see the pyramids must have been built to fit this star pattern. There are too many coincidences and alignments for this to have been random. Pyramid theorists have claimed that world governments have kept the confirmation of the theory a secret because it also points at the existence of aliens. Some scientists have claimed that ancient Egyptians were pointing to where they came from. Conspiracy theorists and extraterrestrial life enthusiasts believe that the confirmation of this theory will bring them one step closer to the truth out there. Over a cycle of 26,000 years, the Earth wobbles slightly on its axis, and this leads to an apparent change in the position of stars. This phenomenon is known as precession. However, with computer technology, it's possible to turn back time and see exactly where stars were during the time of the pyramids and when these alignments occurred. Even the air shafts within the Great Pyramid has a precise alignment with the Orion constellation. It's interesting to note that other theorists have laid claim that the Teotihuacan pyramids in Mexico and the Zion pyramids in China are all aligned similarly and when mapped out across the globe align with each other in similar fashion. There is broad speculation as to how these three ancient civilizations whom never had contact with each other managed to design, engineer, and build these fascinating structures that match the star alignment in Orion's belt. If the pyramids were created by a progenitor civilization, who were they? The creation myths predate history and authors of the progenitor race theory suggest that in 10,450 BC, a major pole shift took place, before which Antarctica lay further from the South Pole than today, and after which it shifted to its present location. This earlier civilization theoretically centered on Antarctica, and later survivors built the Olmec Aztec, Mayan, and Egyptian civilizations. If humans of today suddenly disappeared overnight, much of our knowledge and even our existence would be gone in a few hundred or thousand years. None of our digital technology would survive, and even books and paper would dissolve in time. The only thing that would survive would be our stone masonry, and that is rare. Is it possible that well before our known modern recorded history, there existed a technologically advanced civilization that predates man, and what we see today is merely remnants of that long lost race? Could all the ancient monoliths and structures be the leftovers from some ancient race we know nothing about? If this is so, then it would mean the Egyptians did not build the Giza pyramids, but simply discovered and uncovered them from the ancient sand. Stonehenge could be much older than suspected, and many of the unusual artifacts and constructions we equate to ancient civilizations are actually much older and were not built by early man, but rather rediscovered and then claimed by them. This civilization could be responsible for the Atlantean story, and even predate the Sumerians. In fact, this civilization may not have even been human, 
or at least not human as we know it. If they were advanced technologically, they may have had contact with ancient aliens or at least begun exploring the stars, or they may have come from the stars themselves. Could all the myths and legends of our history actually be remnant knowledge of a race that existed before the Great Floods, perhaps even older to predate the Ice Age? If the Earth was wiped clean of any reference to this race with floods and cataclysmic events, how are we to know who they were and how advanced they were? All of the artifacts we continue to discover in ancient sites point to advanced knowledge our early ancestors could not have fathomed. The only thing we can do is piece together the myths in a logical form and look at the mathematical precision they imbued in every structure left for us to examine. If humans had absolutely no contact with aliens, there's still plenty of time between the existence of the dinosaurs and modern history for more than one or two advanced civilizations to have emerged on Earth. After all, our advanced technological era is only a few hundred years old and further back to the invention of the wheel is but a few thousand years. There could have been several advanced races in existence before our recorded history. This could also mean that we are only a blip in time of a race that is advanced to our current technological age. Humans may simply be the remnants of several lost civilizations that predate our knowledge of history. Mankind himself our DNA may be much older than we can calculate. We know that even in our historical record, there are races that are lost in time. We have no idea who built the structures of Gobekli Tepe, a recent archaeological site unearthed in Turkey. It appears to have been intentionally buried by a civilization unknown to modern man we have no clue what it was or its purpose. Pumapunku could be a very old advanced city that used amazing puzzle stones to construct its buildings, and the Great Pyramids of Giza could be giant ancient machines we have lost the ability to operate. Our methods of dating rock are sketchy at best. In fact, we cannot date rock at all. We have to date organic material near the rock to guess at an actual age. The truth is, most of our estimates of the age of ancient sites are educated guesses at best and downright lies at most. Modern scientists hate to admit they really know nothing about the actual age of earthbound ancient architecture. Even written records of the construction of ancient sites may have been the result of the people who discovered them laying claim to their creation and writing history to appear that they built them. The Great Pyramid is claimed to have been built in 20 years, yet we know that is impossible. That is 13 blocks quarried, transported, shaped, and fitted into the final positions in the pyramid every hour, day and night, non-stop for 20 years. Even with a huge labor force, this would have been an impossible task. And to do it, the methods to move and place the blocks would have taken up more time and space as to make the pyramid itself appear small in comparison. Ask why do Egyptologists still adhere to this flawed time span for construction of the Great Pyramid when plain logic argues against it? It's because they actually do not know. They have no clue how long it took, nor who even actually built the Pyramids of Giza. And yet still we are told to accept these nonsense explanations and not ask the important questions.
For many modern skeptics, the world's oldest writings on clay, stone, and papyrus is simply myth. However, if we dismiss all the ancient literature and inscriptions, the Bible, the Quran, the Mahabharata, and thousands of clay tablets from Mesopotamia as too incredible to believe, we would still have to deal with the question of the physical evidence. Who built the ancient megalithic structures? How were they built? Why the practice of building pyramids at ancient sites all over the earth for a period of time and then suddenly abandoned them? Who marked the earth's surface with gigantic lines and figures? And why and how were these things done? In this space age with its remarkable technological advances, it's becoming apparent that the miracles and other seemingly unnatural events reported in ancient texts, the megalithic constructions and the enigmatic lines and artwork over the earth resulted from an advanced technology which was incomprehensible and indescribable by the ancient human observers. We must open our minds to truth and even alternative explanations of the ancient artifacts, structures, and buildings that dot the landscape of our world. We may never know the whole truth, but if we can vanquish the lies and look only at what is left, then, and only then, can we begin to get a complete picture of our Earth's mysterious history.